Welcome to the Wannabe Podcast, the podcast that takes you from where you are now to where you want to be in 30 minutes or less. Happy Black History Month. I'm Imriel Morgan, founder of Content is Queen, a podcast community that specializes in empowering and amplifying underrepresented voices, specifically women, people of color, and LGBTQIA people. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Wannabe's focus is to help you take consistent action to build a successful life and career in the creative and entertainment industries. But this month, we're going to spend some time looking back as well as forward. Today's guest is Fiona Compton, a historian, filmmaker and visual artist. Fiona is also the founder of the incredibly popular Instagram page Know Your Caribbean, a platform dedicated to the enrichment of the history and culture of the Caribbean. Fiona is also a podcast host and you can hear her wonderful voice on the Relatable podcast, which is a safe space for black people. And she recently launched the Know Your Caribbean podcast for people that wanted to dive deeper into some of the stories and histories that she shares on Instagram. In today's interview, Fiona and I talk about the desire to leave your mark in the creative industries. We talk about owning the title of historian and reframing history without the white gaze. We also talk about some of the financial and emotional barriers and obstacles that come with sharing Black and Caribbean history. Let's get into it. Who did you want to be before you became who you are today and why? I wanted to be a fashion designer. Oh, I had found, yeah, I growing up in St. Lucia, I had found this, it was like in Seventeen magazine. If you remember Seven, does it still exist? I don't even know. I think it's very American. I think it does still exist, maybe. Yes. And in the Seventeen magazine, they had an article about this young woman and she was going to Parsons. And she was talking about how she started her fashion journey making clothes for her dolls. Oh. And I'm like, oh, I do that too. And she made, of course, she made New York sound amazing. And Parsons is like the epicenter of style and fashion and Mm -hmm. that kind of thing like that. So I think that's the the first career I really saw myself wanting to do something in the the creative arts here. Yeah. And what happened? (laughs) I came out to London when I was 18. And you know what? What do they do when you bring you to London for the first time? They bring you to places like... Leicester Square. So mm-hmm. you go to Leicester Square and I'm seeing all of these artists on the streets who are way better than I am, right? And I yeah. see them on the street hustling. I think that was a, a, a big reality check for me. So I did take the artistic path anyway and I went to Central St. Martins. I did my foundation. I Then I went to London College of Printing, which is London College of Communication. But I did photography because ah. I said, oh, the whole dream of me being this artist in New York with big canvases and my own studio, it didn't seem realistic anymore. And I said, I should do photography so that way at least I could be hired by companies that can help, you know, tie me over for magazines, newspapers, whatever, while still being creative. So that was me trying to take a responsible choice. But in uni, this one photographer came in to like, give us a talk. And he's like, yeah, if you think you're going to be hired and get a steady job from this year. Around, <laughs> I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I don't really call myself a photographer anymore, but I was for a very, very long time. Fair enough. Yeah, photography is notoriously difficult, no? <laughs> to mm-hmm. get, to break into. What kind of photography did you want to create? Well, one of the frustrations I had is when I was doing my degree, once again, still very green in the whole thing. I was very frustrated that when you're talking about representation of my degree course, it was coming from a very, in terms of representation of Black people, it was coming from a very Jamaican-centric focus. Oh, interesting. Or a West African focus, because those were the two types of representation of Blackness that, yeah, that dominated when they had, so see, of the 1% of the time when they did talk about Black people in my degree, it was, that was the only time I was like, yeah, but I don't, I'm not Jamaican, I'm not West African, and I feel like we have been condensed into this monolith, and it frustrated me, and I knew that when I left my degree course, I said I want to do stories of my own people, mm-hmm. people from St. Kitts, people from, you know, St. Lucia, people from Cuba, people from all over, to show just how dynamic we are. So that was the the decision I wanted to do. 
the photography I ended up doing was corporate, corporate and oh yeah, fair enough. <laughs> I could already, I could, I already got the picture in my mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, was. it was corporate. It was not creative at all in in any way, shape, or form. Even when I tried to be creative, the people didn't care. Yeah, I think it's just you know, it was just more like the whole kind of perception in the Caribbean is just reggae music and joke chicken, and I find that narrative obviously extremely reductive. It was just things like that that I wanted to do just to show that part of us that we have so much more to give or, you know, there's so much other elements of our existence. So that was, that was what I really wanted to do. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. I do want to get onto how you got into history and wanting to share that a little bit more and like to dive deeper into that because history, I would say that history I was a massive like fan of history. I wanted to study history. I got really into ancient history, ancient black history. And I learned black history growing up. And then we lived in the Caribbean. And they teach you the different islands histories as well in like mm-hmm. social studies and things. So I have a tremendous amount of love for the subject. But I always found that, especially because I went to school here, secondary school, primary school, and then eventually university I went to in the UK, I always Mm -hmm. found I got put off of history because it was so white. When I find out that people have become historians and they are from black and Caribbean backgrounds in particular, I always find that so like it's a curious thing because I think that the barriers to entry in history are so high. (laughs) Absolutely. How did you push through and just say, actually, you know, I am a historian. I'm going to claim that title for one, which is such an academic and historically white title to take on, but also to then tell the stories of Caribbean history and like going about finding those stories and doing that research and pulling together content then that went on to tell those stories? Yeah, I mean, how it started, it, it became an extension of from the work I was doing like to my photography and film stuff. Because one of the projects that I had done was when I left uni, I decided to do, because I was so frustrated in, in how, just like you're saying in history, my degree was very white. Mm-hmm. So I decided to take, I was like, oh, what if I took like some of the most recognizable pieces of art and made black versions of them? So that included things like the girl with the pearl earring. I -hmm. did uh, one of Mona Lisa, a Marilyn Monroe, and a whole bunch of stuff, a whole series. And then I started to look at incorporating different historical things about it. So, for example, the Mona Lisa, I called her Mona Latica because (laughs) just incorporating the elements of our Indian heritage in the Caribbean as well. So, you know, things like all the curry, what we eat and thing like that. It's curry came to the Caribbean through the indentured laborers from India. Ganja too, right? It's all the weed that everyone thinks is like a black thing was brought across from the laborers from India. So incorporating those things. And even when I did my retake of the girl with the pearl earring, so she's the girl, the seashell earring, looking at the Madras fabric. So the Madras fabric is something you'd find in St. Kitts, St. Lucia, Dominica, Guadalupe, Martinique is a, is a plaid pattern, right? Mm-hmm, fabric. Mm-hmm. And looking at the history of that, how it came from an area of Madras in India across to Africa, used as a means of trade, and then became this revered fabric in the Caribbean. So all of those historical elements, when I started to find out, oh, this fabric that we we hold so dearly, especially like in St. Lucia and stuff, Madras is such a big fabric, but knowing that history, I'm like, oh, that's so cool. Yeah. So it, it started, it started from that. And then the second part was through my mom. So my mom was part of the archaeological society at home. And she always had a bunch of old maps and paintings and stuff in the house. So I guess inadvertently, I absorbed that at home, right, growing up. Mm -hmm. But then because my mom is not tech savvy like most parents, she started to find (laughs) out about eBay, right? So yes, now she would send me to, oh, Fiona, this card, this card is is going on eBay, this card. I'm like, and can you help me bid or can you bid on this for me? And then. (laughs) <laughs> Coming to find out <laughs> is these old cards, old pictures of the Caribbean from like a hundred oh, plus years wow. ago. That's Beautiful so cool. porch. It's amazing, amazing, amazing. It, like if you went on eBay now, you, you typed in like old postcard Jamaica, or old postcard St. Kitts or St. Christopher's, they'd call it. You'd see beautiful, like, you know, our ancestors dress, how they used to dress. Sometimes you see images of women in like these long white white pristine white dresses ironed and beautiful Mm -hmm. but they're barefoot Mm -hmm. you know so even looking at those kind of details and that tells you a lot that they had a certain sense of pride even though they may not have had the means to buy shoes and then I started to think to myself 
man, when was this? Oh, who was that person? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you, then sometimes, especially like when you're saying about history being so white, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when you're talking about the Caribbean, be like, oh yeah, in 1764, this and this and this British battalion, this and this French battalion, Mm -hmm. that, (laughs) and all of this naval history is just so dry. So sometimes when I'm reading things, it'll be one sentence that gets me. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what did you say? And then I'll start digging and digging and digging. And then you find the magic there. I want to know from you, like, how challenging then is it to dig up and unearth some of those stories, especially if they are just treated as an afterthought or a single moment in time that's worthy of a sentence and nothing more. To have those stories been documented somewhere and how easy is it to uncover them? Yeah, it's tricky. There's no one resource. People always ask, what's your favorite book or can you recommend readings? And I have loads of history books at home Mm -hmm. and most of them are unfinished because I'd be like, I read a segment and then I need to reference it to another book and to another book or another archive or something. So it's very scattered. There's no one source, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of finding some of the obscure things, it is once again from a one line Mm. So, for example, there's like an amazing piece of history about this rebellion that happened in Antigua. And I remember the first image I found of it was this drawing, and it was very graphic, of the freedom fighter. His name was Akwamu, but Mm -hmm. they called him Prince Class, of of his execution. And I remember very early when I started to get into Noya Caribbean, that's the image that I put up. Because, you know, sometimes you see things that are like, oh, my God, this is so horrible. And you share it without thinking, right? Yeah. But... They just said, oh, the Pennsylvania Gazette of 1736, whatever, right? I'm like, what the what? The Pennsylvania Gazette. And then you find out they have this archival page. You may have to pay a subscription because a lot of things, especially in academia, you have to, it's not free, Mm, right? Another barrier then. Yeah, exactly. And then, but yeah, I was able to find this newspaper clipping from the, the Pennsylvania Gazette, which is in, you know, North America. And it had a complete, really descriptive account of what happened with Aquamu and talking about Cox blood and a rum oath they took wow. and the thing that he said and he did this amazing war dance and like it was so empowering right it wasn't written in an empowering way they were saying oh he's horrible negroes and it's whatever but I'm like war dance like oath Cox blood rum gunpowder he had a sword and this like feathered thing and this is sounded so beautiful And that's where you have to kind of look. You have to look really hard. But it's there. It exists. Yeah. Especially in like the diaries or the writings, especially like within the era of slavery, a lot of people wrote diaries. So sometimes you'd find things like when they had a whole war in Jamaica with the Maroons and stuff, Mm -hmm. I found a letter and the man was like, please send guns quick. You're coming for us. We're really afraid. Oh, wow. (laughs) That's insane. Yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> so that kind of thing you're never gonna find in a in a history book, right? They'll just gloss it over and talk it in general. So you really have to dig. So there are blockages in terms of financial blockages, and because things are very obscure mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. Why Instagram and what made that the channel that you felt like actually this could be the place I start to disseminate these stories in this history? Yeah, um, because everyone's on Instagram all the time. <laughs> Fair enough. So, <laughs> yeah, because we, we're yeah. addicted to it, right? <laughs> but I think people just like learning things in small bites. Yes. And Instagram does that. And then I like overlaying, say, a dancehall video with <laughs> a reference to something from like 17, whatever, whatever, as a way to connect people to the history because I think it can be very boring how history is presented. And I don't ever want to do that. So I think Instagram is a really good platform for it to be short, snappy, palatable. You read it. Okay, wow, I never knew that. And then you move on, keep scrolling. You can watch whatever else you're watching. So I think that's it works best. Yeah, I agree. I've really enjoyed consuming information and education on Instagram more so than anything else. And I think that's why I've got like such an appreciation for people who are sharing stories that we don't hear. I do want to talk about stories of Black joy and, yeah, like the just joyful aspects of our history. And so much of Black history, or at least so much of what we hear of Black history, is so (laughs) traumatic because we have had 
horrendous things happen to us as Caribbean people, as African people being colonized and African-Americans maybe as well. So I wanted to know how mindful are you of making sure that there's a balance between the stories that you feel like, well, it's important that we know this because it's a part of our history, but also to counter that here is joy and how easy is it to find those moments of joy and, and respite? Girl, it's hard, you know, because I've found myself having to double curate the stories that I share because sometimes I find things that are really eye-opening and mm-hmm. I feel it's necessary, but I'm also aware of how it makes me feel. And it, like, I would be like depressed for like three days out of reading just one page from something. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, yes, I want people to know it, but I need to pace it as well. I don't want the page to be filled with trauma. Yes. It's education, but, but to, because we've had enough of it whether we just because we don't know the details of it yeah doesn't mean we don't feel the mm. repercussions of it so I'm very mindful of that and so I do really do my best to also show lots of joyous things as well it just because a lot of my references are books written by white men because that's all that we have right within that I kind of translate. So when they say things like the Negroes were contorting their bodies in all these heathenistic ways and demonic ways i'm like yo they were broken out they're doing their <laughs> tail like you know what I'm saying? so it's things like that so you have to decipher put on your own lens when you're reading these things to find the joy and it's not change it's not like you're changing history right mm. but it's looking at it from a, a different perspective because obviously the people who wrote this were white christian for the most part uh, pro-slavery or anti-black authors Mm -hmm. So you have to look at their observations and then put it into the context of your own understanding of what was going on. So that's what I do. Yeah, that's amazing and actually so necessary. It's not something you'd think on the surface to think about. Maybe there's probably some people who are aspiring to share history and actually won't think to reframe what they're reading because of the references. Because, I mean, even though I was taught critical thinking at university, I studied anthropology, which involves elements. Amazing! Of, yeah, I did biological anthropology. The early anthropologists were so problematic. And I think I'm, I was lucky that I came from a home where I was taught to question everything. Religion, question it. My dad's a Rastafarian, so boy, questioning was in, right. is in the spirit. <laughs> um, yes. My whole family's <laughs> Christian. My dad's Rasta. It's like, I was never going to get out easy from just kind of absorbing what I was listening to and hearing. But I think there is something about that active reframing of what you're reading because it's like well that doesn't sound right and being able to then confidently assert that so I do want to talk about your voice within Know Your Caribbean because it's so dominant and so distinct how did you get the confidence or build the confidence to share and reframe these stories in a way that you could like confidently portray that and actually it's like nah they were brucking out it wasn't this demonic satanic ritual like this is not what it was (laughs) There's just no way that could be what it was. And because you have to confidently assert that for people to take that at face yeah. value, you know? <laughs> I think, especially when it comes to our dance and our expression, I think deep down we always knew that it was BS when you'd say those kind of things. Mm-hmm. Because I think, I, I really do believe in the power of the drum, for example. I mean, once you start playing the drum around Black people, it's a rap. It, it could be the most devout Christian whatever right and mm-hmm. i mean even if looking looking at black churches yes most of the time black churches are real hype anyway yes. in comparison to white churches and if you look at it, like historically they worked really hard in removing the drum like the drum was like banned across like from the carolinas across the whole caribbean it was wow. like, illegal right it was like yo and the fact that the drum exists so much in our culture today right so they tried to remove the drum and they pushed very hard for Christianity, right? Mm-hmm. And the fact that the two exist now still and how the drum has been incorporated into Black churches. There's so much music, there's so much dancing, there's so much revelry, which at the time these white people would have said was demonic. But So therefore, I think when I'm looking at how these descriptions of us, especially in moments of joy, mm-hmm. and they're describing it as demonic, I think we know, though, it's not. Mm-hmm. Because once you start playing the drum, we start moving anyway. And you feel something in your spirit. Our spirit is irrefutable. I think that's what it is. So I think maybe that's why I, f- I have a certain kind of confidence mm-hmm. when I say certain things like that. Because we know it, even though we don't know the details that this thing happened in 1812 or whatever. 
but we know it in our spirit. And I think that's something you kind of refute. Yeah, that's true. I think you're right. There is an instinctive feeling of that doesn't sit right. That doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound like that's what they were doing. And I think I can say that now. I can more confidently say that now. I think back when I was learning some of this stuff where they were like, witch doctors used to do this. And I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> it's like it, you just feel a little bit of like a sting yeah it just kind of hits you in your chest like that doesn't it doesn't sit right yeah and it's like this yeah. isn't exactly my culture but I'm I'm also like there's some something condescending and something misunderstood in the way that it's being expressed to me that doesn't feel right I'm really happy to see and, and of the people I've spoken to for this series in particular actually there kind of is this kind of taking back our stories and owning them and reframing them and actually disseminating them in the way on our own terms I think is very empowering and I think social media has been great for that it's definitely been terrible for lots of things but this new wave of educate using it for education and democratizing information has been so empowering to see and actually it's quite nice to see that platforms like yours grow and just keep growing and growing and growing so the, the interest is definitely there for it I do want to touch on the fact that you have launched a podcast for the <laughs> for Know Your Caribbean <laughs> which is essential yeah first of all big up content is queen <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> but I mean touching on the thing that you said about social media right I think social media has been very powerful because it's cut out the middleman. Mm -hmm. Even in looking at how Africa and the Caribbean have now forged or like strengthened that relationship because it was almost non-existent before. It was just kind of imaginary. And social media has really bridged that gap. But yeah, so the podcast, the reason why I started it because there's just so much information to share and it's really difficult to condense everything on Instagram. Instagram is like I said, it's like short bursts. Mm -hmm. And I think because seeing the growth of the platform and to see that actually people really do care, Mm -hmm. it's not that we don't care. People like to say, oh, Black people don't care about their history and whatever. But I think it's just that, you know what, the history that has been presented to us has been draining and from a wide lens. So why would we really want to engage with that? There's loads of Black history podcasts that speak about African history and African American history. Mm-hmm. And that's wonderful and very much necessary. It was very hard for me to find specifically about Caribbean history or the historians who were talking about Caribbean history were white. Mm-hmm. Now, not to say they were they were talking crap or whatever. There, some of them are really, really amazing. But you know what? Sometimes, you know, like sometimes like when you looking for like to meditate, yeah, and things like that. And you want to hear a voice that sounds like you. Yes. Not like a white voice. Like the other day I said, oh, I want to look for some bad bitch meditations. I like the way I found was this white lady. She's like, you're a bad bitch. What? <laughs> you're a badass. I'm like, yo, this is <laughs> whack. <laughs> so <laughs> I, want, I want people to hear their own voices <laughs> when we're talking about ourselves and Academia is so white dominated and I just want people to hear a voice that sounds like theirs, an accent that makes them feel like the person who's talking about the history understands and connects in the same way that you do. That's one of the reasons why I did it. And I just I just felt like because people want to are asking loads of questions and wanting to know more. So that's why I put it out there. I love that. I do have one final question. What is the best advice you've ever received and what's the worst advice you've ever received? Hey, Lord. Uh, <laughs> that's hard. There's no specific person who has given me, I think it's a combination of, of people on both sides who have given me different derivatives or have tried to suggest things to me, right? And over the time, I've condensed it into two things. Of the two the, the two things, one I should listen to and the other I should not listen to. Mm-hmm. Sure. And I think the first one was people trying to curate Noya Caribbean to be something, to be a very academic themed kind of page. You need to speak in this way and you should not use slang or you should not curse because they have professors and universities watching you. And I should not be on Instagram whining or you know I need to dress in a certain way and those kind of things yeah and that kind of advice makes me extremely uncomfortable and I I stopped listening to it but at the time of receiving that kind of feedback Mm -hmm. um it was very demotivating 
And I don't want you to feel that way when you're coming onto my page. I want you to feel like you're having a conversation with a friend Mm -hmm. and that education, no matter what we're talking about, it feels open to you. And it also feels good, even if it's sometimes difficult, the Mm -hmm. topic, but that you're having a conversation with a person that you can relate to, not this professor with a doctorate and yeah. you have to come in your nice you can come and talk to you know like you can pull up to if New Caribbean was like an event yeah you need to come in your battery riders <laughs> like you know what I'm saying and like come have a drink and let's talk so I think that was the advice I had to learn not to listen to and then it stems from people encouraging me to be that and that, that is what I would say is the best advice to just be myself and to work with what feels good for me. Mm-hmm. I think ultimately, no matter what advice somebody gives you, you have to follow what makes you feel good. Yes, agrees. And I think, yeah, that's that's it too. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Fiona. Something that really sat with me after this interview was the importance of finding and confidently owning your voice. I really loved what Fiona had to say about reframing the sources and looking at what was being described and reimagining that without the white or Christian lens. It's powerful stuff. I highly recommend you check out Know Your Caribbean on Instagram. It is a wealth of knowledge, but also joy, color and light. And do check out the podcast, which has the most beautiful production behind it. I hope this half an hour has made you think, reflect and contemplate what your next step should be. If you enjoyed this episode, please do share it with your friends or on social media. If you're a podcaster or thinking you can do what I do, please do check out contentisqueen.org where you can access free resources, talks and news as well as joining our community. That's contentisqueen.org. That's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening and until next time, bye. This is a Content is Queen production, hosted by me, Imriel Morgan, edited by Joseph Perry, sound design by Amber Miller, music and sound effects are from Epidemic Sound. See.